Already getting hot out there. Too hot for me. No, it's hot. <laughs> 83, that's hot. <laughs> that's nice. I need to be, I need, I need to live in Alaska where I <laughs> nice and cool all the time. Huh? She's the youngest, and if someone raises their hand and needs to ask a question, you can get it to them. Should I just stand on the sideline? Oh, like Oprah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening. good evening. It's good to see everyone here this evening. I want to take just a moment to welcome those who are joining us on Facebook and YouTube. We appreciate you being here. Uh, tonight's class is, uh, we finished the book of Hebrews last week. Any remaining questions on Hebrews before we press on tonight to our Q&A? All right. Well, before we go there, though, let's remember those who... Uh, uh, are on our prayer list, all those who are in need of prayer and God's help, let's remember them. Are there any additional individuals we need to add to uh, our prayer list? Yes, ma'am. Right. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Keep Teresa in your prayers. She'll be leaving tomorrow to head to Indianapolis for a couple of weeks. And keep her brother in your prayer as well, Joe. Uh, she's going to see him and uh, keep him in your prayers. All right, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father, we bow before you, thanking you, praising you that you're our God. As we come into your presence, Father, we ask you that you forgive us, cleanse us from our sins, wash us, that we might stand justified in your sight and Lord we thank you that Christ accomplished what he accomplished at the cross so that we could and we can forever we thank you for loving us so much we pray you'll be with those who are on our prayer list those who are in need of your help your assistance and father we pray for young sister and the home that she lives in father you know all the needs there and we pray, Father, that you'll 
intervene in those situations, whatever they may be, that it might work out for her best. We pray, Father, that you be with those who are grieving, those who have lost loved ones. We pray you'll comfort them as only you can. Be with us this evening as we discuss things that have to do with your will and your word. Help us that we might find truth and that we might embrace it and practice it in our lives. We thank you for the cross, the one who hung there. Thank you for your spirit who dwells in our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Help us to yield our lives that we might be the people you call us to be. For we pray it in Christ's beautiful name. Amen. All right. Question and answers. We got a, our girl here ready to go with the thing. Questions. Uh, looks like Jane's got one in the back. Okay. My Sunday school class, um, Michelle's son, Joel, who's about seven, uh, we've been studying, our theme has been that God is all powerful. Right. And so when we were talking about uh, Christ dying on the cross and how he died for our sins and how painful it was, his question was, well, he, God's all powerful. Why did, he, why did he feel any pain at all? And I wonder how would you have answered I know how I answered him. I wondered how you would answer him. And he had another, I thought, very interesting question for a seven-year-old. Was um, we were talking about Christ going up into heaven, at, that he's risen, and that he's gone to heaven. And he's saying, well, he had to go through space. Did he hold his breath? <laughs> and I said, well, I think there's three heavens that I've, I've heard him talk about. Right. I said, I can't find it for you right now, but I'll ask David about to tell us about the three heavens. And I, and I also said that Christ, and I, I hope I'm right, uh, when he ascended, he was in a spiritual body, not a physical body. I hope that's right. Uh Pretty close. Uh, Christ can, his body is a glorious body now. It's been resurrected and he just instantly can appear in a room. So I guess obviously the second person of the Godhead can just, uh, now that he has ascended back to the Father, I'm sure that uh, he has uh, all the attributes of God, uh, God the Father, God the Spirit. Uh, and but he is always going to be a man. Uh, Timothy actually, uh, Paul wrote Timothy and actually said, uh, Christ Jesus, there's one mediator between man and God, the man, Christ Jesus. Uh, so Christ will always be the God man. Uh, he will not rid himself of the flesh that he wrapped himself in when he came into this world. Uh, but that risen, resurrected body is glorious and actually Paul would in, in 1 Corinthians 15 actually say that we shall be like him our, our bodies will be like his and he talks about the glorious powerful bodies that we'll receive at the resurrection and he even likens it to a, a grain of corn or wheat that when it's planted it's, uh, it's a grain of corn or wheat but when it comes up it comes up a glorious stalk it's nothing like what it was when it was planted, and he actually likens our resurrected bodies to that, in that uh, when we are raised from the dead, we shall be like him. Our bodies shall be changed. This mortal will be put on immortality, and this corruptible shall be put on incorruption. So I think you answered it right. Uh, he didn't need to hold his breath. He can materialize and, and dematerialize, and uh, he doesn't need a... Uh, he doesn't need Star Trek and the, and the transporter and all that to do it. You know, he can just blink his eye and be on the other side of the universe in a moment. But um, his body is a glorified body. It's no longer just simply flesh and blood. Uh, but it is flesh and bone. He actually would say that to Thomas when Thomas said, I will not believe that he's raised from the dead. He wasn't there the first appearance of Christ. And he said, I won't believe it until I stick my finger in the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side. And when Jesus appeared the second time to them, he told Thomas, see, here I am I, 
Touch me, for spirit hath not flesh and bone as you see that I have. Thrust your hand into my side. Put your uh, fingers into these nail prints. I mean, he basically was performing proof that he was bodily resurrected. One of the greatest, uh, uh, one of the first uh, false doctrines that was being taught was that, uh, it was being taught by the Gnostics, and it was that uh, the Gnostics claim to know. Uh, that's what the word means, to, to know. We're the ones in the know, and we know that matter is inherently evil. Therefore, Jesus could not have had a body because that would have been matter, and matter's evil, and he couldn't be uh, in any way evil. So therefore, he didn't have a real body. He had a ghostly, phantasmal body. It looked like the flesh, and it smelled like the flesh, and it walked like the flesh, but it wasn't the flesh. And, of course, John deals with that in his first epistle and says that if anyone says that Jesus did not come in the flesh, this is Antichrist. And uh, because Christ did, in fact, wrap himself in human form and come into this world. Uh, the first question was, how, why didn't God just... The pain. The pain. That and, that and, Jesus... And, Jesus had had pain on the cross. I was trying to explain. It was very right. pain, and he did it for us. And he said, "Well, you know, God's all powerful. That's what I've been teaching him right. for three weeks or more." Right. And uh, he was. And and you're right. God is all powerful, but even God Himself, uh, I'm not going to say God has limits. All things are possible with God, but God cannot lie. And he cannot change. He cannot lie. He cannot change. He had a plan that he had made promises in reference to. But why even put that plan in place if it involves pain and suffering? Why not skip that somehow? And, and what we're doing is we're looking at the power of God, that omnipotence that God has. And that's fine and good. But God is not just omnipotent. God is also uh, just. And justice, divine justice demands. What's the wages of sin? Death. The wages of sin is death. Uh, Romans the 6th chapter verse 23. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God's justice, and, and I've said this numerous times from the pulpit as well as from the podium in the classrooms. God's justice cannot be swept aside. He is just and he is judge of all the universe. And even Abraham would say, surely the judge of all the earth will do right. Uh, he can't just by virtue of love. See, one of the things that happens today is people go, well, God is love. You know, he's not going to, he's not going to really reject anyone. And that's where your universalism comes from. But that flies in the face of statements that Jesus made. Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life and few there be that find it. But I've stated on many occasions that God is just, and if you ask me, the cross is a demonstration of God's justice. Christ died to satisfy the justice of God. John would actually say in, I think it's 1 John, the second chapter, that he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. I believe that's 1 John, the second chapter, verses 1 and verse 2. But uh, that tells us something, that Christ is a, a, a sacrifice, a substitution. He took upon himself our sins to satisfy divine justice. God is all-powerful, but we need to understand that not everything is subject to power. Some things are subject to what's right and what's wrong. God cannot lie, so there's something God cannot do. Wait a minute, God's all-powerful. He should be able to do that, right? He should be able to do anything he wants. Can God string together a number of words that actually ends in an untruth? Well, of course he could as far as say those words, but because of his character, because he is holy, just, righteous, he would never do that. And he doesn't change. He is the same today, yesterday, and forever. The Hebrew writer actually said that, and we looked at it. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So God doesn't change. He can't change. It's impossible for God to change, because if he changes, he's either going to change for the better, and therefore imply that he was not as good as he could have been, or he's going to change for the worse, and therefore imply that now he's not as good as he used to be. 
And so there are some things that are not subject to power, but subject to character, subject to what is right and what is wrong. And the justice of God had to be satisfied. And because the sin that we committed, you know, I've often asked, well, why didn't God just send, a, send an angel to do it? Surely there was an angel. If Polycarp can go to a, a burning death uh, at the stake, surely an angel would have been happy to step in and take upon himself our sins. But see, that's not possible because the one we sinned against. We didn't sin against angels. We sinned against God. And because we sinned against God, God is the only one. And actually, we need to get this too. God is the only one who can forgive sins. Forgiveness takes place in the mind of God. When Jesus, when Jesus was in, I believe it was Peter's house, and those four men came and they couldn't get in to see Jesus, but they wanted to get their friend who was paralyzed, they wanted to get him in front of Jesus because they knew Jesus could heal him. What'd they do? They went up on the roof and figured out how to break through that, that roof. It probably wasn't too hard. It's probably made of clay and maybe some tiles and a couple of things like that. But they, they broke through and lowered that guy. And Jesus, when he saw their faith, the ones who brought the man, when he saw their faith, that they believed that if they could get their friend in front of Jesus, Jesus would heal him. When he saw their faith, he said to the ones on the mat, your sins are forgiven you. And the Pharisees and those who stood nearby were like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. And they're thinking, no, 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 no one can forgive sins but God only. You know what? They were right. They were absolutely right. And had Jesus not been the second person of the Godhead, they would have been correct in their condemnation of Christ. But he was the second person of the Godhead. And, of course, Christ calls him on the carpet and says, okay, fine. All right, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven you. Or to arise and take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power while on earth to forgive sins. He said to the sick of palsy, take up your bed and go home. And that man got up who had been laying on that bed forever. You know, he just got up and walked out of there. That proves his point. Proof of the puddings in the eating. And that was some good vanilla pudding right there for the fellow that was sick on that bed. But he got up. So to answer... Yeah, why did he do it like he did it? Again, I'm convinced that when Christ came down to the cross, when it's, it's zero hour, and he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he is praying three times, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but thy will be done. Three times he approached God asking for the possibility, if it was possible, to let that cup pass from him. And here's the thing. The answer was no. It wasn't possible. Now, I personally, I believe that Jesus prayed that prayer for us. That we might, one, realize there was no other way. And Jesus would do that when he was at the tomb of Lazarus in John the 11th chapter. He prays to God and says, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I know you always hear me, but I said it for those who stand round about that they might know that I am the resurrection and the life. And I'm persuaded, me personally, and I can be wrong on this, but I'm persuaded he, he made that prayer, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And when the answer was no, that tells us something. There was no other way. Surely, an omniscient God, all-powerful, surely an omniscient God, if there was any other way to save us, would have went that route rather than put his son through what he went through. I'm convinced Gethsemane tells us there was no other way. And it doesn't matter that God was all-powerful. There was no other way to rid our sin. God himself had to take him upon himself so he could justly forgive us and say, I paid that fine. I paid that fee. I suffered death because I satisfied those wages for them. It's a substitutionary death. And because he had no sin of his own, that's acceptable to the righteousness and the justice of God. So I don't know if that 
answers your question. Another. Just had a, a couple of So his focus was on the pain and suffering of Christ that he was feeling that pain. Right. And I know you. I've heard you say that Christ set aside some of his godly characteristics. To I believe so. Yes. To to be a man. Yes. And and I tried to explain to him that you know he was Christ. And, but when he was on earth, you know, he, he took on more human characteristics, and that's why he could feel the pain. I don't know if that's right or not, but that's what I told him. I hope it's right. And the other thing, uh, address the three heavens, if you might. Oh, the three heavens. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's a celestial, terrestrial. I'll have to look that up. I believe it's in uh, 1 Corinthians. I believe it's in 1 Corinthians. Let me take a look here. I got my little electronic Bible. I don't know if it's going to work, but we'll give it a shot. How do you spell terrestrial? T E R R E S T I A L. <laughs> well, let's see here. Y'all got to give me a second. There's no way. This one actually made me, I don't get nervous usually, but uh, when you can't study for a class, you know, when I can't sit down and say, I don't know what y'all going to ask, so I can't study for this. I just have to, and I obviously can't spell either, so let's see, this don't have a spell. Has anyone found it? Celestial, terrestrial? Okay. I'm pretty sure it's in 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 12, 2 maybe? I was close. It's in Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, what is it? Maybe 12, 2. Did you say 12-2? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, okay. Maybe. I, yeah, I knew, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body. Is that it? That's what it is. That's what it's saying. I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into par unto paradise and heard unspeakable words, which are not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but my but in my infirmities. Um, this one actually, okay. Let, let's just deal with this: the celestial, the terrestrial, and then the heaven that God dwells in. We're talking about the atmosphere where the birds and everything fly. Then we're talking about space where the planets and the galaxies and all that is. That's the terrestrial. And then we're talking about the third heaven, which is where God actually dwells. And, and I'm not so sure if these are, in fact, places that you could plot on some universal map and just say, okay, we got to go live last 14 galaxies and then go out of the universe to this place where God dwells. I think it's more of a, uh, an existence that is maybe not even of this realm, uh, but there's not a lot of information on that, Jane, other than these three heavens. But I know the first two is the atmosphere where the firmament, as the King James puts it, where the birds fly and, you know, the clouds and the rain and the thunder and the lightning and all that takes place. And then, of course, the, the space, the terrestrial, where the planets and the stars and the sun and the galaxies and universe exist. And then the third heaven where God actually dwells. And that's in a place that I... I don't know, it could actually be in an entirely different uh, existence in a different realm as far as I know. Not a whole lot of information there other than, you know, we can look at the Hadean realm. When we read the story of the rich man and Lazarus, we see where one went to uh, uh, Tartarus, which is in the Hadean realm. We talked about that, I believe, in one of our classes that we dealt with. Uh, and the other one went to paradise, uh, Abraham's bosom. Uh, this also goes parallel with what Jesus said to the thief on the cross when he said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So we know that there was these two places that existed in this other realm, the Hadean realm. And it was one place was a place of uh, pain and suffering, for the wicked, and then the other place was a place of uh, comfort and rest. And uh, because one was ready and the other wasn't, they went to their different abodes. But I view that as a realm. Now, in the Old Testament, that was called Sheol. 
And it was looked upon as this, this realm where the dead are, and it didn't divide them like Luke, the 16th chapter, does when it uh, talks about this uh, rich man and Lazarus. It doesn't divide them up in the Old Testament. It just talks about going down into Sheol. And, of course, the idea was that it was somewhere in the middle of the earth. And, uh, of course, uh, there's not a lot of information to where you can say, okay, was it somewhere physically? Well, I'm not so sure it was somewhere physically because you're talking about spirits who left bodies. You know, they, Lazarus was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, paradise, the paradisal side of the Hadean realm, and the rich man wasn't carried by anyone. He just got instantly translated from this earth and from this life. His body's still left behind. They probably had a big, big funeral for him and everything else and used a lot of his money to pay for it. But he wasn't there. You know, he has already lifted up his eyes being in torment. So... Uh, is it a physical place? I'm not so sure it is a physical place that we can point to and plot on some universal map. But it is a real place and it exists because God is there as far as uh, going to heaven. So, but again, I don't think Jesus like flew. You know, kids today, they see all these superheroes on television. You know, I had Mighty Mouse and the Roadrunner. You know, I mean, that was, that was the extent of my cartoons when I was a kid. And then uh, later on, He-Man came along and stuff, but I'm all too old to watch cartoons now. But now they got all kinds of stuff, and they can fly, and they have all, all kinds of power and stuff, and, and kids can get a little confused uh, about uh, having power, how power satisfies everything. But it, but it doesn't. Uh, God's all-powerful. Yes? 1 Corinthians 15, 40. There's also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is of one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There's one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. So yeah, it was 1 Corinthians 15. He was talking about this celestial heaven, the terrestrial, and so forth. He's actually drawing... Uh, analogies there to the, to the resurrection of the dead because that's the topic in 1 Corinthians the 15th chapter. The resurrection of Christ hence the resurrection of us when we come forth from the graves at the end of time when Christ comes again at the last trump the voice of the archangel shall be heard and we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump and this mortal will be put on immortality and this corruptible shall be put on incorruption. But he's talking about different glories. And, and I think that there, there's something to be said there in reference to. Um, I believe that God right now is, is very much involved in our lives uh, in, in so many ways. Probably we don't even understand. And our, uh, our rewards are what we make them on the other side. I mean, Jesus said, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but rather lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Uh, Paul would actually say, seek those things which are above, not those things on the earth. So we're laying up treasure here. And I believe that our resurrection and our place in glory on the other side will be according to to our works. I mean, the great apostle Paul, I mean, when James and John came and said, hey, can we sit one on your right hand and one on your left? Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. Can you be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? And they said, sure, no problem. He said, you shall indeed be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with, but to sit on my right hand and my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to the ones for whom it is prepared. So that tells you something. There's someone who's going to sit at the right and left of Christ. That's a place of exaltation. I believe the Apostle Paul is definitely one of them. Yes, ma'am. So I have a question from the chat. It's from Dave Martin. Uh, it Dean says, Martin? Dave, Dave. 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 Oh, okay. Uh, Dave. I just said Dean Martin. I'm like, he's still around? Man, that guy's just hanging on. He's been petrified. But anyway, go ahead. <laughs> <clears throat> he said Matthew 17, verse 21, speaks to, speaks to prayer and fasting. Where is fasting in the church today? Should the church collectively engage in fasting? Matthew 17. Verse 21. 21. Okay. Okay, Jesus has come down from the Mount of Transfiguration. We actually just hit that in our uh, Sunday morning 
uh, story study on the life of Christ from all four Gospels. And his disciples that did not go up on the mountain with him, uh, they could not cast out a demon-possessed boy. And then, of course, Jesus became a little frustrated with their uh, faithlessness, and he took care of the situation. And then his disciples came to him and said, Why could not we cast this demon out? And he uh, actually answers that. Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have, this is verse 20, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind, speaking of the demon that they could not cast out, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. So the question is, should we fast? Is that, should we fast? Or why does the church not fast? Because the church collectively engaged in practice. Well, Here's the thing that you've got to be careful of. Turn over to 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter. Fasting is never commanded in Scripture. It is implied that then the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. All right? But in 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter, if I can get there. They didn't move it again, I hope. There you go. 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter, in verses 1 through 3, actually, I believe, is a prediction concerning the apostate church that would develop, which would eventually, in my opinion, become the Catholic church. And the reason being, and I'm not saying that just to be mean, I'm just saying it fits perfectly right here. Paul would tell Timothy, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Here's the thing. Our motto in trying to go back to first century Christianity and just simply be the church you read about in the Bible, our motto is to speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent. To have no creed but Christ, no book but the Bible, no law but love. In other words, it would be wrong for me to say to everyone here, I, I would be guilty of doing exactly this if I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. The elders and I have talked about it, and we're going to all fast on Monday. Everybody in this church, if you're a faithful member, you got to fast. And I'm commanding you to do something that the Scripture does not command you to do. It implies you will, but it completely implies that it's voluntary. It's something that you do when you have something that you want to pray about. Let me tell you, you want to energize that prayer? Quit eating. Quit eating and start praying. Don't worry about taking any food. Like I said, I, I've fasted a few times for a number of things. The longest I've ever fasted was seven days. I wanted to fast for 40 because I wanted to experience the same thing Jesus experienced. By seven days, I was so weak, and a couple of my friends just basically said, you, you got to eat something. you got to eat something. And, uh, but it was voluntary. No one can command us. Now, see, this, this church that would arise, it's not in good shape. It's predicted. But the latter days, they'll, what do they do? Depart from the faith. They give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. They speak lies and hypocrisy. They have their conscience seared with a hot iron. And what do they do? They forbid to marry. And that fits what I said, the Catholic Church. You, if you're a priest or a bishop in the Catholic Church, you can't get married. Not unless you get some papal exemption. And then also commanding to abstain from meats. How many of y'all remember when you went to school... Way back then when they had the little 35-cent lunch platter and you got it and everything, what would you eat on Fridays? Little fish squares. You got fish squares. You know why? Because there were Catholics in schools and they didn't want to offend them. They could eat fish, but they couldn't eat meat. But that's why they did it. That's how widespread it went. So it fits. The prophecy fits. And I've always said if the shoe fits, wear it. But the fact is we can't command someone to do something. Because there's not a command in Scripture saying you must. Now, there are commands saying not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. So we can tell you you need to be in church on Sunday. 
You don't need to forsake the assembly. There's commands saying to give on the first day of the week. So you need to give on the first day of the week. When you worship, you need to sing. You need to pray. You need to hear the word of God preached. You need to surround the table. All those things are there. Those are commands in Scripture. We have examples from the first century church. But fasting is never commanded. Paul recommends it. He advises it, he himself, and fastings often when he goes about his own qualifications as an apostle. And let me tell you, fasting is going to happen because there's going to be stuff in your life you're so serious about. And you're going to say, Lord, and you know what? When you, when you go to God's throne and you're saying to God, Lord, I, I'm begging you if you can do this. If it's within the boundaries of your will and you will do this and I'm not going to eat. I mean, look at what happened with the apostle Paul. When he was Saul of Tarsus and Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. I mean, he thought he was pursuing a false prophet and the followers of that false prophet. That Jesus was not the Messiah. That this is a false religion and it's getting a foothold and we got we to gotta kill this thing. And if we got to kill people to do it, that's what we'll do. In Acts the 22nd chapter, he told, uh, I forget which official it was. But he actually told him, and when they were put to death, I gave my consent. It wasn't just Stephen. But then all of a sudden, he's confronted on the road to Damascus by Jesus himself. And he says, who are you, Lord? He's blinded by this light. Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you persecute. Go into the city, and it shall be told you what you must do. For three days, he didn't touch a bite of food. He didn't even drink. What did he do? Prayed. That's all he did. And I, I, I wonder what was in those prayers. I got to think, man, forgiveness. I, I thought I was doing right. Six times in his writings. I, uh, I don't think if he did not fast that God would, responded, would have responded differently to his prayer, as long as the prayer was what it was. I don't think fasting... It affected God's response. Oh, no. Paul was a chosen vessel. And Christ even yeah. said that when he told Ananias, he said, go to him, tell him all the words of this life. He had told Paul, go into the city, and it shall be told you what you must do. And he told Ananias, go tell him all the words of this life. And Ananias said, he's a real bad dude, man. I don't know. You sure you want me to go there and deal with that guy? And he said, go. He is a chosen vessel unto me, and I will show him all the things that he must suffer for my name's sake. So, no, I'm not saying your prayer, yes or no, from God. God can okay he's not fasting that's a no you know only going to answer the only only going to answer the fasting guys yeah okay I'll give it to the I'll give it to you you're not fasting no I'm not giving it to you how long did you fast two hours and I thought come you up. were implying that no 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 talked no, about no. your own person. no I'm just saying that when God sees wow this is so important they forbid food there's it says something about the the yearning that you're having for whatever it is you're praying for. Of course, it still has to be according to God's will and within the boundaries of his will. Yes, ma'am, you had a question. So in regards to other people, they might additionally refer to Matthew 15 where Jesus says when you fast. He does when not you say fast. if you fast. Exactly. Yeah. Good idea. Yeah, Matthew 15. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Now I'm all the way back over in Timothy. Well, you've been studying that word there, oh, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, I can tell. <laughs> I tell you. But, yeah, Jesus, when you fast, don't let other people. Is that where he said don't, don't, don't let other people know what you're doing? Wash your face. Yes. You know, the, don't uh, go around, oh, man, I'm mouth. so hungry. I've been fasting for two days, you know, praying about something. Because that's like the Pharisees standing on the corner going, Lord, we're so lucky and you're so lucky to have us. You know, uh, it, it becomes one of those things where you're basically boasting about your, your fasting. Uh, he's saying do it, but do it in secret. Do it in secret. Okay. What other question? Yes, ma'am. So fasting and prayer. Voluntary on the fasting, but goes hand in hand with the prayer. Uh, what's your take on, and this is in probably a man-made thing on the calendar, uh, tomorrow says National Prayer Day. And, and there are churches that gather the congregation because it says yes. National Prayer Day. So What's my take on it? Yeah. Uh, well, in my opinion, it's like uh, I said on Easter, every Sunday is resurrected Sunday. 
for us, you know, every Sunday's Resurrection Day for us uh, because Jesus came out of the grave. That's why we gather on the first day of the week. As far as National Prayer Day, boy, we need one. We need it about 364 more times a year, too. You know, I mean, this country needs to get on its knees and go back to God, and we might reclaim and have a great revival and turn away from the evil that we've been involved in for the last 30 or 40 years, how we've moved away from God so much. But, yeah, I believe in, hey, you want to have a National Prayer Day? It's like... Christmas. Was Jesus really born on December 25th? Probably not. He was probably born in the early, early spring and everything. And, and people want to celebrate it, though. I'm sort of like Paul. Paul said in Romans 14, if one man counts one day of higher esteem than another, okay, no big deal. You know, Don't make a big deal of it, but at the same time, recognize the limitations of that. You know, When it comes to worship, when it comes to our uh, Sunday's Mother's Day, right? Tell me, yeah, because I got to, yeah, okay, make sure I don't remember look at that. I'm getting in big trouble now, you know. Uh, <laughs> might get hit in the head with one of them big old iron frying pans she brought. But uh, anyway, so Sunday's Mother's Day. But I won't preach a Mother's Day sermon, all right, because God bless the mothers. Ooh, I got to get carnations or something, too. I forgot about that. I better make sure I get that going. Uh, I got it. I got it. It's all taken care of. But anyway, <laughs> but. But my point is, is that I, w I won't preach a Mother's Day sermon because, you know, I know a lot of preachers that will, and that's okay. I did one, I did one, uh, I did one Sunday, M Mother's Day Sunday when I was here, 10 Things My Mother Taught Me. And, uh, boy, that was a fast sermon. Had to hit 10 things real fast, but, uh, you know. But my point is, is that uh, when they fast, when prayer is not uh, when, it, it's, it's commanded. Pray without ceasing. Paul would say that twice uh, when, you, when you pray. But there's no times of prayer. I mean, what is, the, is it at noon? Three times a day. Three times a day. They, they've got to hit the ground with their little thing. You know what? I'll be honest with you. Though they're praying to the wrong God, I'll be honest with you. The devotion is admirable. Because three times a day, they stop whatever they're doing, and they're going to go to their God in prayer. Of course, he's not the God of the New Testament and not the God of the Old Testament, though they claim he is. But still. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're, that's sort of a, a deal breaker, if you ask me, yeah. So, <laughs> so yes, ma'am. I don't even think it was a rest station. I think it was a, a convenience store parking lot, and it was their time of the day, and he put out his Oh, yeah. He just went yeah. I, I admire the devotion. <laughs> and if we would pray three times a day, you know, we might be a little better off than we are because I know some people don't pray once a day, you know. Another question. Okay. Um, first of all, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace we have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So my question is, I have a situation where if I miss reading the Bible or if I forget to pray, then I feel like I got to do it even more so. So right. my question is, considering it says, you know, through faith and not of yourselves, if that makes me okay, that if I miss one day, it's not, you know, well, um, makes me human? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, <laughs> No, we need, to, we need to get a grip on grace. We really do. And I, I listened to a sermon the other night by Rubel Shelley. Rubel Shelley was actually at Harding University before I got there and left before I got there. Since then, he has written I don't know how many books, and he has been the president of at least two or three universities and colleges. I mean, he's a brilliant man. Uh, but uh, I listened to a sermon that he preached at Pepperdine University in California about two years ago. And it was a sermon on grace, and he was talking about when his dad was dying. His dad, you know, was in and out of sleep and, you know, going through considerable pain, having some painkillers and stuff to try to make it easier. His, it was time for him to leave, and, and he came to at one point, and he, and he actually said, I, I wish I could have just done more. I wish I could have just done more to accomplish more, and then I would not be so worried. And Rubel said he jumped out of his chair and went, stood right over him and said, Dad, you go to heaven because of what Jesus did on the cross. Because that thief on the cross couldn't do nothing. He couldn't go to church. He couldn't give a nickel. And there's a thief walking around in heaven that understands grace better than you do and better than probably most Christians do. 
There's grace, Raul. There's grace. We, we are going to make mistakes. We're going to mess up big time. Some of our mistakes will be little. We forgot to listen to a sermon. We forgot to read a piece of scripture. We, we got mad in traffic. Uh, we yelled at our wife or we were impatient with someone or we thought something we shouldn't have thought about someone else. I mean, that's going to happen, but it shouldn't be normal. You know, that shouldn't be the norm. We should do our best to live lives that are pure and just and good. God calls us to holiness. He calls us to righteousness. But we're going to drop the ball. You know, John says if we, ha if we say we have no sin, we lie and the truth is not in us. Uh, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, the, the question for you and the question for me is where do we walk? Do we walk in the light? Because if I'm living the majority, if I were to put your life on a timeline, and here's the dividing line, below this line is darkness, and above this line is the light, and you're, where are you at? Now, I used to have a preacher friend that thought, okay, I'm in the light, I'm in the light, I sin, whoa, I'm in the darkness, you know. Now, I've got to confess that sin, okay, now I'm back in the light, you know. And he was in and out of grace all day long like a frog in and out of a water. And it's like, Jim, you your, your eternal destiny depends on what time of day you die, whether you died before your last prayer or after it. We live in a state of forgiveness as Christians, faithful, unless we have shaken our hand at God and said, I don't want this anymore. I don't care anymore. I'm mad at you for whatever you did in my life that upset me, and I'm leaving, and I'm not going back, and we walk away. As long as we don't do that, as long as we keep going, and I'm so sorry, God, I, I know I shouldn't have done that. I know I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have thought that. But we, we get up from there and say, forgive me. I don't want that. We live in a state of forgiveness. There is assurance in our salvation. We believe in Christ. We are faithful to him. We may not always perform flawlessly. Actually, John says we won't. But we're walking in the light. And that implies something. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of his son cleanses us from all sin. Implication, we sin while we're in the light. Because his blood's cleansing us while we're walking in the light. So Jim, my friend, my preacher friend, who thought you were in the light, and then when you sin, you're out. And then when you repent and confess that sin, you're back in. What if you sin a sin you don't know about? What if you offend someone, you say something you shouldn't have said, you didn't think it through, it was careless, it was thoughtless, it was cruel, it was unkind, it wasn't love. And you don't even think about it. And you don't find out about it for three weeks. That means you were lost for three weeks until you figured it out. Jimmy Allen tells a story that he went into a post office and a fellow Christian at the church he worshipped at most of the time was there. And when Jimmy got to the window, he said, Jimmy, you sinned against me the other day. And he said, what? He said, yeah, you sinned against me the other day. And he told him what he had done. And Jimmy said, you're right. And I'm sorry. I, I didn't realize I even did that. And, and I'm sorry. And please forgive me. And it was done. You know what? If we would follow Matthew, the 18th chapter, if your brother offends you, go to your brother. A lot of stuff wouldn't get blown out of proportion. It'd just be done. You know, I'd say, man, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I said that. I didn't mean to offend you. And let's, let's just put it behind. Forgive me. And we'd go on. So when you miss something, you know, have you shook your hand at God and said, I don't want this anymore? If you did, you wouldn't be here tonight. You wouldn't be here asking that question. So you're forgiven. You live in a state of forgiveness. Now, should you continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Well, for me, it was just based on missing Our, I thought that I should have. And then my right. mind was telling me, oh, you should have. That's wanted. good, though. Yeah. That's good guilt. You know, there's a such thing as good guilt. When I do something wrong, I need to feel guilty because I did something wrong. You know, I need to feel like, wow, I don't need to do that. That's wrong. That's my conscience, God, God's word working in concert with my conscience telling me, you just crossed the line, buddy. You need to snap to and get back in line. We're not saved by works. Ephesians is right. There's nothing. Listen, I could read the Bible 24 hours a day. I, I could pray 24 hours a day, read, pray, read, pray all day long, and it still would not earn me heaven. I go to heaven because of the cross, and my sins are forgiven because of what he did on the cross, and because I'm still holding on, and I'm not quitting, and I'm not, I, when Sunday rolls around, guess where I'm going to be? Vacation, it don't matter, I'm going to be in the house of God worshiping God, because that's what I'm supposed to do. 
That's who I am. And he deserves that. He deserves that. After what he went through, <laughs> to come to an air-conditioned or heated building and sit on a padded pew and listen to someone proclaim the word of God and sing praises to him and pray to him and give a portion of that which he's blessed me with and surround his table, I don't think he's asking too much. Yeah. And not to mention the rest of the week when all those temptations come your way. Because they will. The devil doesn't quit and he doesn't give up. So be guilty if you did something you shouldn't have done or if you missed something. You know, We need to study. There, there's a lot of people that don't study anymore. They don't pick up their Bible. They don't listen to sermons. They don't do anything. They don't study anymore. They think they got it all down, I guess. Man, I'm like, wow, are you kidding me? This thing is so deep. I know people that have been studying it for 60 years and still haven't figured it all out. But the Bible says study. That's a command. Study to show thyself approved a workman who needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Hosea actually says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you. That sounds like God wants us to study. And, and there's no excuse for not studying. We got it on the radio. We got Good News Radio. If you haven't listened to that yet, tune in through Spotify. You can listen to 24 hours a day, sermon after sermon, from faithful restoration preachers. The Bible's right there. It's on your pad. It's on your phone. It's on your nightstand. It's on your coffee table. If God judges us by, and, and I'm not saying he is, because there's nothing wrong in relaxing. I have to make myself stop. Now, I don't have live TV anymore. But I can watch something on Netflix if I can find something decent enough. And that's not always easy to do. But if God were to judge us by how much television we watch versus how much we study the Word of God, whew, I don't know. What do you think? What's more important? I know that study is not easy, all right? I went to Harding, and let me tell you, Joe Jones scared me to death with all the lists he put in front of us. Study was hard. It was brain-wrenching. And I know it's a job. It's not and sitting and watching TV is easy. You just sit there and watch TV, you know. But still, there should be some time in our weeks that we say, I'm going to study. I need to read this. I need to actually sit down, read the Word of God, let God speak to me through His Word to help me grow and become stronger. Because if this is our spiritual food and we only feast one day a week for an hour or two, but, but guess what okay, happens? It's okay that if you do it every day and you miss the one, it's going to be okay as well. Yeah, don't let the devil take your right. guilt and escalate it to worldly sorrow that leads to death. Right. Because he can do that. You can become so frustrated that you sit there going, oh man, I can't do it. I can't perfectly perform. And the devil says, yeah, you're right. You can't perfectly perform. Why don't you just give up? Just quit. It's okay. You can't do it. You just might as well give up. Go have some fun because you're going to die and you're going to go to hell anyway. You might as well go have some fun, right? Don't listen to that. Everything he says is a lie. God's grace is real. And like I said, there's a thief on the cross that gets that. But we should never take advantage. Here's, the, here's where preachers, especially me, I'm more of, all right, we got to do it. We got to be devoted. We got to be dedicated. We got to be committed. Da 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 da. And sometimes I forget about grace. When I listened to Rubel Shelley the other night, I looked over at Teresa and said, man, I have got to start preaching on grace more. Because. We can get works oriented to where we think we're earning all this and we're not earning nothing. We could be perfect, but there's sin in our past. One sin, whosoever keeps the whole law and yet offends at one point, he becomes guilty of it all. So, uh, but you know, I admire you. Don't let that guilt go crazy, but it's okay to feel bad when you, you missed and you should have been there. You should have done this. You should have done that. What I get bothered with a lot of times is I should have said something. I mean, I, I got news last week. I just hadn't heard from this guy in a long time, and I knew he was having some struggles a while back. About a year and a half, two years ago, I saw some of his comments on Facebook, and I'm like, man, you okay? You know? And uh, I had his phone number. But I never picked it up and called him. And I was looking for him the other day, trying to figure out where he was. He committed suicide in September of last year. He was a preacher. And his wife left him. And he left the ministry. 
and he went back to alcohol and he became depressed and it took him and I'm sitting there going man I probably could have did more I should have picked up the phone I should have called him but you really don't think things like that are going to happen and if I sinned and, and I asked the Lord that night as soon as I found out I said Lord if I missed something there I should have picked up on more and I did not do so please forgive me for my lack of foresight and he will and I, and I, I pray for that man because I'm not sure where he was I, I know it must have been in a terrible place but anyway we're going to drop the ball don't let the devil take that and run crazy with it there's grace there's forgiveness there's mercy and we got to get a grip on that as well as look there's also things that we should do there's commitments and levels of commitment and Jesus said if any man come to me and love father mother brother sister husband wife more than me cannot be my disciple that's where we need to move to but you do not come up out of that water with that kind of love. It's something you grow into as you go. Peter didn't get there instantly. Even after the resurrection, ascension, and day of Pentecost, years later, he's still worried about what the Jews think when the Gentiles come around. Quits hanging out with the Gentiles because the Jews came around. But by the time he goes to his cross, he actually says, crucify me upside down. Because I'm not worthy to suffer in the same way that he suffered. By then, by the time he got to the end of life, no one was more important to him than Jesus. But he had his struggles along the way, that's for sure. All right, uh, any more questions? We've got about six minutes. Okay, I survived. That's good. <laughs> We'll probably have another question and answer next week because I'm sure you'll think about some questions that you want to ask. And then we're going, to, we're going to move back into another book. And I'm still praying about which book we should look at and where we should go. If you've got any recommendations or preferences, I know one of you said the book of Revelation. Just hold on. That ain't happening yet, all right? Because you're talking about eight hours a day studying on that one just to do a one-hour class. So uh, we're not going to go there yet. i still got too many fish in the, in the ocean to catch here and get some things tied up. And we've got a big fall festival coming. We've got things happening. And, and so, yeah, Book of Revelation. Okay, thank you very much for your input. Sure, yeah, we can look at an Old Testament book. Actually, I've preached, uh, or not preached, but taught through Genesis. Genesis is a great place to go because it deals with the creation and sin and so forth and so on. Yes, sir. I'm sorry? I can't. Book of Esther. Well, God's name's not mentioned in there. I don't know if I want to do that book. <laughs> you know, that's the only book in the whole Bible where God's name's not mentioned. And because of that, a lot of Jews disputed whether it should be a part of the Scripture. So, uh, yeah, good, good, good book, and it's not that big. Maybe so. Maybe that'll be a good one. But uh, you guys figured out by now I'm a New Testament gospel guy. Uh, Old Testament's great, and I love it, but uh, I, we're under the New Covenant, and I lean more toward New Covenant because that's where we live. But Old Testament, I've done Genesis before. I will not do Numbers. Uh, that's uh, for the scholar at some school where everybody wants to know who begat who and who begat who, and I can't pronounce half their names, all right? I'm going to have to rename everybody Tom and Harry and Joe and Bob and John and names I can remember. But anyway, thanks for your input, and again, if you have any uh, recommendations, let me know. But we'll do this again next Wednesday night, and um, got any questions, email them to me in advance would be great. You can do that at fccmargate at gmail.com. That gives me a little more time to put some passages together and not just off the top of my head kind of thing. But uh, yeah, if you got any questions you want answered in depth, uh, email me, and uh, I'll be happy to deal with them in depth. Okay, let's uh, have a closing prayer. Again, remember those who were on our prayer list and those who were mentioned tonight, Young, her sister, and uh, the place where she lives. Uh, Ron, would you close us in prayer? Father, we thank you for another time where we had the opportunity to study your word, see it, uh, have it explained in such a way that we understand it better. We pray that each one of us will leave here uh, with increased faith because of what we learn. Be with us and guide us in everything we do and we say, give us safety home. Lord, 
Amen. Thanks for being here.